Jim Joyce. We're, we're, live, we're live live from Orlando. <laughs> oh, that's where yeah, it looks nice and sunny. I was going to turn the the screen here. I mean, obviously dark dark here in, in yeah. Barcelona. Uh and yeah. how long uh, you were hanging out there for? I know you're not hanging out. You're actually working hard, but Yeah, yeah, like I'm here for the week. You know, I did kind of yeah. we 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 actually we took some clients to the Magic Celtics game. Uh you know, we took a box like old school kind of client so yeah. we had like a little event on on monday night the south just got crushed um the local <laughs> orlando people the magic destroyed them so i don't know if you follow basketball but that was a, I, a, a pleasant surprise for people I, from I, orlando i don't <laughs> unless it just kind of scrolls on my screen somewhere and then i right. put put a mental note but but good to know good to know that's a conversation <laughs> starter for tomorrow with someone um but yeah. um Cool. Um, you know, lo lots of stuff happening, I'm sure, everywhere um, on, you know, Health Beacon, your coach. But uh, but we do have a guest waiting already. Um, and and I'm just uh, super excited uh, because I have not seen her for a while. And we're going to let How in. How long have you known, Ann? Oh. Um, actually, and as she comes in, uh, not that long, only just, I want to say... Two years, Jane, who was our guest, Jane Sarenson, uh, introduced us. Uh, of course. As, as Anne was coming here, I think a couple of years back uh, for the Mother last World year. Congress. Last year. No way, Last Anne. year. It no was last way. year. I, I think so. I guess it must have been, but I feel like I've known you for like 30 years. Forever. See, this is <laughs> right? what happens when you're soulmate. That's, yeah. that's right. That's right. <laughs> you guys are like... You're kind of like uh, you're like it's not quite pandemic buddies, but kind of post pandemic buddies. You know, you're kind of like when you're <laughs> you're uh, yeah, it's a different level. Like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But James, we have not met before. Is it James or Jim? It's Jim, and you're welcome to make fun of my name if you like. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think he's a great author, The Dead. That's <laughs> the very dead. good. The yeah, dead. good movie too. Yeah, we have uh, an inability to, to punctuate sentences is 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 what we have in common other than our name <laughs> okay okay otherwise nothing else correct <laughs> well I, I live in ireland so i'm like the, the you know that's kind of, oh yeah, my I'm gosh calling. okay okay yeah that's great i'm married to an italian he spent a lot of time I, you know james joyce was an entrepreneur you know did not know i yeah, didn't either movie theaters and uh yeah set up all kinds of businesses yeah yeah so he was uh yeah he was a man of many talents you know <laughs> Anyways, interesting. We can, we can move on. Well, I, I, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, right? We, we, we want to go get to know Anne. So, first of all, welcome to the shot. It's long overdue, even though we just realized that we only known each other for a little over a year or something. Uh, it's still dumbfounding. Um, tell us about Anne. Take us, you know, as far back or 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 not, and, uh, personal, professional. <laughs> you know, we we can dive in some gossip. Sure. I don't know. Sure. Oh yeah, we could get into gossip too. It's always so funny because I've been in the industry long enough that, you know, paths just cross and you realize it's probably six people and a lot of smoke and mirrors. So <laughs> that's how long I've been at it. And um, I've, I've had a couple of different things that I've done, but I would say the real hallmark is working with early stage or startup companies and all in healthcare data. And the last several companies were focused on using digital mobile apps or decision support tools to help consumers navigate the healthcare system. Because as you both know, it's unusually confounding here in the US. And so when I left my last startup, uh, I was in Chicago all of my career and decided to move to DC. I wanted a new chapter, new phase. And uh, ended up moving here in 2017 and then got recruited to run the ATA at the beginning of 2018. And um, our friend, mutual friend, Lee Shapiro said, did oh, yeah. you really start the pandemic? Because, <laughs> oh my God, what a period for you. But it was, it's so been- The American, the American, hmm? the American Telemedicine Association. Correct. And so oh. did a couple of things when I came on board. Um, one was, first of all, the board has been awesome. And I and it's gone through a lot of changes in the last five years also. Today, our chair is Christy Henderson from Optum and Joe Kavidar, who's been really yep. a pioneer in the industry, is on the board. 
Sri Chagaturu is the chief medical officer. I mean, you go on and on on the roster and it's just phenomenal. So I feel very, very lucky. And um, when I joined at the beginning of 2018, it was clear that pre-pandemic adoption engagement was pretty anemic. And so in telehealth, and so set out to create a new vision. And I don't know if you guys have read or heard Simon Semenek's, um The Why TED Talk yeah. about yeah. why people do what they do. And I've always liked that because it just resonated with me. And so the why we're here is really to ensure that people get care where and when they need it. And that when they do, they know it's safe, effective, and appropriate while enabling clinicians to do more good for people. And so that really established us and set us on this course of we were going to focus on adoption engagement and we were going to focus on making the ata more of a organization as opposed to a professional society and so mm -hmm. that was a really important transformation as well and we, and we also went through a rebranding i gotta say it's the american telemedicine association because oh my gosh, you know, there are a couple of things that are wrong or just limit us or don't speak to what we're doing. Yep. Right. And as you both know, though, a huge reband branding can be a very expensive proposition. So we did a, um, a more practical approach, which was acronyms. So yep. we're in good company with KFC and <laughs> Weight Watchers and everything else. So. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, well, your your coach is YC um, Health Beacon. We're HB ATA. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Be, before so I've been we dive... here now five years. So there you go. Wow. Go ahead. No, I was going to say before we dive in because there's just so much to unpack that the ATA and kind of the usage patterns and you know the word that we up until recently were not trying to mention on this podcast. This was a COVID free free zone every Wednesday zone. for Jim and I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right. Let, let, let's rewind back because you, you mentioned you were working with kind of early stage startups, I think. Um, and I looked it up a couple of days ago. Z Zest Health was one of them, actually. I think a seven Zest, wire right? uh, investment yeah. company and, and others. Maybe uh, if you can kind of contrast, because you've been at ATA five years, um, maybe just contrast the world before and what you see now. Mm -hmm. So... What is interesting about the previous companies I started or I led was that they were all about helping consumers, as I said, navigate. And yeah. what's important about that is this notion of meeting consumers where they are and making it easy and creating a better experience for them. So that was what drew me to telehealth yeah. because it's the consummate expression of, tele of uh, consumerism in healthcare. I mean, and, and so the other issue was that as you recognize patterns that we've been dealing with in the U.S. and the U.S. healthcare system, and think about, for example, the Dartmouth Atlas that started coming out in the 1990s, it was showing that we had really big problems in terms of access to healthcare, and variation in cost, in outcomes, in how long it took for something that was evidence-based to get to everybody. You know, the fact that you'd have a C-section in one city, all things being equal, and you'd have a normal vaginal delivery in another. It's like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. right. And so those were things that we knew about free, February, March, 2020. And so as I thought about it, you can't solve for those problems without doing what Bob Walker talks about, which is really reimagining how care is delivered. Mm. We can't churn out enough clinicians to take care of our aging and increasingly sick, problem, uh, sick population. And yeah. this is an issue we have in the U.S., but it's also global. So, so Anna, so, I'm, I'm, trying yeah. to, I'm trying to place, I got the the mid-Atlantic Chicago, the under the beltway, you know, where the accents are. And then obviously you're, you're quite, uh, you're, you're highly educated with your literature. What, what did you, where did you grow up and what did you, what did you study? Oh my gosh. Okay. He, he's going backwards um, I, even more. Okay. I'll go backwards <laughs> even more. So I grew up in the South side of Chicago in Hyde park, okay. which is in the same community as the university of Chicago. Yep. And 
Um, I was a product of the public schools. I'm a big proponent of public school. Yeah, I think we we lost Anne. We'll get it back. Yeah, we'll get it back. I I love private how you schools bring, or yeah, I, I love how you brought <laughs> it all the way back uh, and, and and kind of went right into the ATA, which is uh, uh, you can tell it's your passion, right? So it was a great place to grow up, and it taught me that the parameters of what's acceptable is very broadly defined. You know, it, there's a lot of diversity in the community, in the public schools, and I saw that as a strength, the ability to get along with a lot of different people. And um, I ended up going to school, college in Minnesota, Ooh. and that was anything but at the time, back in the day. <laughs> and uh, that was also an interesting experience. And Are, um, are you a gopher? No. no. But the Minnesota gophers, isn't it? The, um, yeah, 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 the Minnesota gophers, yeah, <laughs> look, yeah. Look at so you, my, Jim, my I'm impressed. Daughter, it, yeah, my daughter is a rabid Chicago Cubs fan to okay. the point when the White Sox were in the World Series. I offered her a baseball cap to wear with the White Sox on it. And she's like, no, mm -mm, not going to do it. So come from a long line of very passionate people. And, you know, you get into something and there you go. So I was I went to a liberal arts college, which really gave me the opportunity to learn that taking information from diff different points or disparate data sets, if you will, and triangulating them in a way to paint a picture. Um, that was ultimately what my skill became. Mm. And from a business perspective, I was not a technologist, I was not a data person, but I could talk to people about what my data fantasy was or what I wanted to right. have and understand what they were doing and come to some realization about what that product might be. I love it. Does that make sense? I love it. And, and that's the one of the best words I, I've ever heard, data, I, data I, fantasy. I know. I, I took that down. That's amazing. That, new hashtag trending. Oh, on it, it to... <laughs> it's true. So anyway, that that yeah. is how I ended up in healthcare. Awesome. And I ended up really with not in the delivery system. I did a stint there and um, I ended up instead in companies that were providing products and services it, it, to the delivery systems and to payers. It, it, when you look at the, when you know, in thinking about the dis big decision to join the ATA and move to DC and, and did you have like, and you obviously were involved in startups. Did you have some uh, experience, like, like how many times did you either service yourself or your family with telemedicine before, you know, you know or, you know, remote, care management did you have really personal experiences about it or was it kind of a new thing to you so i was very lucky because i had a lot of physicians in my family okay. so what i learned was audio only rocks it really can be very effective so that was the limit of my experience though so um what i brought to the ata was again this commitment to helping consumers get a better experience, but it was also this idea that I had had certain privileges in my life that I think should be made available to everyone. Right. So no. that was really it. I was going to say, since you, you mentioned uh, family members, and I was going to say probably your telemedicine was sort of FaceTime or whatever, but, but you mentioned audio earlier. So uh, I, I was too late. That's to my, how old I am. Yeah. That's how old I am. There was no FaceTime. But yeah. there's something about audio. Audio is wild because I, I find like, you know, just when you just have the voice, like we're in such an interesting period where now we're consuming and interacting with each other through video and audio and and yet listening to all this podcast and all these books and information coming into your head, um, is something, yeah. is there, do you guys study that? Like do you, when you, with, as an association, like the, you know, if I clinically support you through audio versus if I clinically support you through audio and video, is it, you know, is, is, does audio sometimes beat video? Well, it certainly beats it if that's all you have. Right, right. Right. Okay. That's a good point. That's a good so, point. That's a good point. <laughs> and and that's been one of the one of the things that I have loved about this very sad period in our history 
is that in 2018-19, it was clear to me that there were certain myths associated with telehealth. And one of them was that it was only FaceTime. It was only what we're doing here in terms of video visits. Right. Another myth was that it was somehow second-class citizen. You right. know, it wasn't the same quality of health care. Mm. Um, another myth was somehow that it was only important for people in rural communities, not mm. recognizing that there are medical deserts in urban markets like D.C. and Chicago and New York and so forth. Right. And so you take all these myths, and I would say one by one, they've been really knocked over or disproven um, uh, during the pandemic and during this incredible experience that we've had and this ability to really work with a treasure trove of data and say, you know what? It's not different. It, right. it, it is different, but it doesn't give you bad results. Right. Yeah. Like I would wonder, I would wonder, like I've, I've had my, like I started my experience in business where I was involved in just communicating with people through telephone. And I miss those, like the intimacy that you could get through audio and relationship forming, you know, it's just different. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not better or worse in my opinion. It's just different. And there's kind of a, there's an intimacy in audio that sometimes gets overshadowed by the video because I, you know, I'm spending probably 30% of my time here staring at myself mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm a human and, being, and, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think what he's trying to tell me, it's like a subliminal message, like no more video with you, man. <laughs> like just call me like good old. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. This, but, this is oh effective. Oh my gosh. This we should be re, this should, this should be this podcast is was effectively uh, telemedicine therapy for me and Eugene here. That's what we've done. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's good. That's how it started. I'm happy really. to be a therapist today. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I will say, you know, one of the things that we're very cognizant of at the ATA is that virtual is not for everything, right. and yeah. it's well suited to some people, some situations, some instances, and others it's not, and so part of our focus has been, how do we lay out what omni-channel looks like that's effective, that's consumer focused, that enables more people to have access to care, mm. good quality care. And so that has really been something that we've been obsessed with. Before, you know, I'm, I'm super, super curious because as an association organization, right, uh, a big component of this is kind of policy, uh, uh, you know, advocacy, but before we dive deeper into it, because you mentioned a lot of the myths, I'm actually curious, like, how did you gather all of them? Was this like, was there a process around gathering these myths and like, obviously making that an agenda to demystify or demythify the, them? Like, was <laughs> it demyth demythify? <laughs> it's not even It's very Barcelona. Very Barcelona. It's very Barcelona. Yeah. <laughs> very Castilian. <laughs> um, so the myths, again, going back to being a liberal arts major, was what I heard from people and yeah. then coming up with seven or 12, you know, depending how Catholic I was feeling that day. And so <laughs> that was really, and, and I would substantiate it by looking at data. So it's, it's more of trying to group things that I had heard. So that was really how the myths were formed okay. initially. And others, you know, contributed to them or helped me solidify those. And what has been really interesting is to see the research that's coming out or reports from the OIG that say, no, telehealth is not subject to more fraud. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like, hello, and you could have had a V8. So I think those mm -hmm. are really, really important for the world to know. And the, the research that's been done by Mayo and Bart Demarchek, who's a physician and only recently rotated off the ATA board, showed that the evaluation of folks using virtual versus in-person really mesh, meshed up over 85% of the time. So somehow, you know, this idea that it's second class mm -hmm. or not as good quality, you just keep on chipping away. And that's very important for policy work, just to tell you that. Yeah. Well, let, let, let's dive in, right? I mean, you know, pandemic hit, right? Uh, obviously, you know, ATA and, and anybody and every company that's been doing tele anything got a huge boost because there was no choice, right? You know, what does that 
policymaking process through the pandemic, but I actually think it's probably even more interesting now, I don't want to say post because it's still officially, but as we as this is the new normal, right? And and mm -hmm. the rates of telemedicine usage, you know, kind of normalized for lack of a better term. So walk us through kind of the policy making and, and advocacy aspects of the organization. Absolutely. So prior to February, March 2020, we had formed a policy council. And this was a group of individuals that had submitted their names or nominated by others to participate. And we selected this really phenomenal group that was the breadth of the organization membership. So folks from multi-hospital systems, professional services organizations, um, technology solution providers, and they all came to the table and what was remarkable and so inspiring about them is that they checked all their competitive influences at the door. And they really sat down and drew up policy principles that informed our work. And these are the things that you find on our website that basically say, you know, we want to make sure that telemedicine is practiced within guidelines and standards that are law, that are established law. We want to make sure that anything that is created or legislated or regulated doesn't treat telehealth virtual services differently than in person, as if somehow laying hands on people is the gold standard and virtual is not. Um, we were very concerned about back even then poly uh, privacy and confidentiality, confidentiality and cybersecurity. Um, so these were the policy principles that we came out with in the um, prior to 2020. And so that informed our work. And so it was very easy then to say, okay, now that this has happened, what or has started, let's take this policy focus and translate it into very specific asks that we can use to convene the community, you know, we're now over 400 organizations, convene wow. the community, plus also take those asks at the federal level, uh, both um, at the Hill, as well as the executive branch, and say, here are things that we think should happen. And so that was a really important and formative part of our work, because it set us up to be the voice of the industry. And I will say that, that we were very successful at that. And I had always been concerned that if you have a lot of splinters out there making the same asks or related asks, you dilute your effort. Right. And we see that over and over. So our goal has been to convene and keep people within the same general policy principles. And then when you join the ATA as an organization, you know that's what you're signing up for. And we happen to be incredibly lucky uh, with the policy team led by Kyle Zebley, who's just remarkable in his work. And he and I were both raised in homes that said you attract more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. And <laughs> that's how we operate. Right. It's right. really moving things forward in a a professional and appropriate way. So you must be invited to a lot of cocktail parties in DC then. <laughs> like, this seems like that's, it. <laughs> you know, it's hilarious because DC is all very new to me. It's not new to Kyle at all, but coming from my world, it was like, what do you mean? I can't say that. Or why wouldn't I say that? And it's right. like discreet. <laughs> How do you spell that? So uh, <laughs> these are all new behaviors for me, but I, I am surrounded by really smart and amazing people. So it, and always, what, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, it'll no. always be learning, ABL, right? So just- ABL, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, to no, be curious it. about it. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. tell me again why I can't do that. I'm trying to wrap my head around that. So, yeah. But I love the authenticity. I love the authenticity and, and that's great. It, it, when, what, what do you think about, like, so, I mean, are, are you as blown away as like Eugene and I are uh, about, you know, chat? you know, and how that plays into, you know, the chat API, the, you know, what is just, it just seems like technology, you know, like I was in, Eugene, I was telling you this when I was in Italy, like I, I speak very, I speak bad Italian and, you know, my wife is Italian and I would take the Google translate and I would just open up my phone 
and and yeah. have it translating as I was talking. And it was really it was it was useful. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't hardly perfect. But then we have this whole all of us had this chat API experience where it seems mm -hmm. to. I put in my thoughts and it seems to articulate them better than I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so I've got it going. So is that, is that, do you start to think about policies around those things or how are you thinking about that transformation? So I think chat is remarkable. And again, thinking about this idea that you can't use, you can't have enough clinicians to have a one-to-one -one experience for all situations. Right. And so you have to use technology to leverage. And what we saw during the pandemic at the beginning, at least, was number one, the speed of change was amazing. And the providers, the solution providers and the delivery systems and the payers, they collaborated in a way that was just magnificent. So it, it, made, it made it really easy to work hard on their behalf because they were busting their chops. And I think with that, what was also remarkable was how they iterated so quickly. So you can iterate on chat pretty fast, right? Right. And so they were coming out with these um, ways of interactive assessments of, do you have this, if this, then yeah. this, then this, and no, you, it sounds like you don't have COVID. So those right. things all came out very, very quickly. And the fact that you didn't need to necessarily speak with someone immediately that you could do some work on and, your own for that. So, And Jim, I think it's your, cause you mentioned just chat. I think you started talking about more about chat GPT, right? And those oh, are- Yeah, what I call it, yeah. API. So yeah. just, yeah, the chat, the chat API, chat GPT. But I, <laughs> it's interesting because part of that whole discussion is the upstream diagnostics that could potentially right. be somewhat automated, but not, you know, and, and personally, I can't speak on behalf of all the telehealth companies. So it's not my role, but, you know, to me, telehealth is a vehicle and then, you know, or, or plumbing or the delivery mechanism. And I actually, right. my, my question was going to go, you know, whether it's Chad GPT or, or the MetPal or anything else that starts getting plugged in to assist right. physicians, right. To assist clinicians. I think that's where I'm, I'm kind of seeing where that, that is heading, but also virtual first companies, you know, are right. they not, we don't, it, it's like, I don't even call them telemedicine and telehealth companies, it's like virtual first care now. Right. So it's, I don't know. Right. It's, it's kind of well, interesting. And it's the evolution. telehealth is hell. It's yes. the tagline telehealth is hell. Okay. And I think you're exactly right, Eugene. If you think of, virtual or telehealth as a modality of care, technology enabled, digitally enabled, however you want to refer to it. The reality is, is that there are many components within that. So there's the, the way the modality expresses itself. And that's probably not the right way of putting it, but asynchronous, synchronous, remote yeah. monitoring obviously is huge. But then a lot of what's under the hood on these, these services is AI. Mm. So again, I in my never ending quest to keep us relevant, it's really, well, what role do we play there? What is the unique point of view that we have on AI? Well, it's making sure that we've gotten rid of biases, that mm -hmm. we, um, we can have folks attest to the fact that their data sets are good data sets and they work for white women and black women or women of color. Mm -hmm. So uh, th they're just, there's a lot there. I think the other is, um, stepping back for a second is the whole notion of trust. Mm. And so we think that this is a really big emerging, emerging issue that we have to get out in front of. Because yeah. I think people in this whole period, and you've seen it, there are changes in terms of who they trust and how much they trust. We have to make sure that healthcare providers and the system is one that people still can turn to and believe. And mm they should feel comfortable that the care they're getting is legitimate. There's nothing nefarious about the person they're interacting with online. So those yeah. are really important issues to us as well. You know, I wish we had hours and hours. Um, we don't. So I do want to jump into a very quickly the conference that's upcoming. And, you know, Maureen and I are looking forward to being, I, I called it for the first time, I think a year or two, I visited San Antonio and I kind of called it the Venice of Texas. I don't know. <laughs> oh, because of the waterway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, and, and the, uh, we're looking forward to having you there. So, 
No, definitely. But maybe tell us a little bit more about it uh, to our sure. millions of listeners and, and viewers. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for that. And uh, I am really excited about the conference because uh, the focus is on, you know, how do we do this now? What what do we do with all this? And there's a couple ways of thinking about it. One is, you know, what does primary care look like? But even as you think about digitally enabled primary care, you have digitally enabled cardiovascular care and cancer mm -hmm. care. It's like, who do? Well, mm -hmm. there are some amazing companies doing that and learning about that more. I think the issue of, uh, again, as we touched on cybersecurity, privacy and confidentiality, those are issues. We have a lot more of the patient voice that we've incorporated. So we have a new 501c6 that's being led by Kyle because we've been so successful on the advocacy side. And ATA Action has created a Patient Voices for Telehealth Coalition. And this includes organizations like NORD, the National Organization for Rare Diseases. Mm -hmm. So those folks, and there are over a dozen organizations that are part of the Patient Voices Coalition, they're going to be at the conference and talking about, from their standpoint, how important this modality is to their communities. So it's March 4 through 6. And we want to make it as easy as possible, recognizing that these are, for many folks, challenging times economically. So what I'll do is provide you guys a code that you can make available to your audience and just eliminate as much friction as possible. Because we think that it's our responsibility to convene and help people connect and learn, know that they're not on their own, know that there's so much opportunity and promise with our industry and when we do it right, we're going to make a difference for so many millions of people. And it sounds like you have a broad swath, like it, it, it's a broad church of people that will be at the conference. Like who will the typical? That's correct. That's correct. So again, our members include delivery systems, uh, provider groups, payers. It includes academic medical centers and then a range of solution providers. Okay. Ranging from the big behemoths, the ones that create the technology, to the ones that are really developing and providing very unique solutions in different modalities or different flavors of telehealth. Awesome. Including telecoaching, Jim Joyce. Telecoaching, <laughs> um, amen, amen. <laughs> anyway, um, well- Oh, that this... does remind me that I did have an experience with telehealth before the ATA. I fractured my shoulder skiing. Ah. In Vail, and I went down the toboggan of shame, had shoulder surgery, and I was, all of my PT was done virtually. A little oh, wow. app that woke me up in the morning and said, yeah, it was great. It was so fun. Sorry, I forgot that. Awesome. See, it brings coaching up to, to jigger, you know, good things. Right. <laughs> good memories. It's amazing. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. So thank you. On, on, on that note, we go for the last, last question that Jim always asks. I will hand it back to right. you, Jim. So you're... You're walking out of, you know, the, you know, the latest cocktail party in DC, you know, after a successful, uh, successful time, you know, espousing all the benefits of, of support and virtual care. And you're feeling really good about it. And you're with your good friend, Kyle, and this, this young uh, woman comes up to you, this um, super enthusiastic uh, woman with a mid-Atlantic accent, accent that she had, had trained in the in the finest of liberal arts schools. And she looks at it and she goes, and you like, like I've been following your career. I've seen everything you've done. And, and I've been inspired to start my own virtual healthcare company based on a, on a ski injury that I had. I, I was inspired by the support and everything that's happening. And, but, you know, I'm just getting started here. This is a big intimidating space. One, what's one piece of advice would you have for me? And so if you were looking at your younger self, what would that advice be? In starting a company, yeah, do it with a team. Yep. Get people who are better than you to work with you. And it makes all the difference in the world. And then um, listen to your customers because usually your customers have great ideas. So we love it. We love it. Absolutely love it. And thank you so much for joining us. And, um, you know, I don't know thank if I can you. convince Jim to go, but I will definitely see you. With oh, Marina we'd love to have you there. We'd love to have you there.
Perfect. Yeah, I look forward to it. Now I got a code. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, you will. Okay. Thank you all. all right. Please Have a good week. Okay. See you. Bye. You too. Bye.